Welcome everybody to our next focus on geothermal with the energy for the weekend. Today I'm glad to welcome Alexander Richter from Think Geo Energy. I think everybody knows uh, he's the founder of Think Geo Energy and meanwhile he's working also as director for the Iceland Renewable Energy Cluster. He will introduce now the newest project of Think Geo Energy. He created in the last month a geothermal map of all power plants worldwide, and this he will introduce and the database behind. So, Alexander, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jochen. And I'm very pleased to, to, to share some background and, and details on our, our research, and last but not least, uh, the map that we created. Uh, and and it, actually, we created the map uh, actually quite a long time ago, um, and, and the plan the, back then was to to create a, a, a strong database behind it. So we actually had set it up that uh, you could click on a plan, you would get some more details, and, and and there would be individual pages. And long story short, this was a web development project that uh, um, didn't work. So it basically the website was idle and really not up to date there were some challenges with it and about a month ago we decided okay let's let's revisit the the, the database and within uh, i think uh, within 10 14 days we 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 went over every single plant worldwide and, and with locations and data behind it and and finally updated the the, the map and the database behind it uh, and it was a big big effort uh, but it was really rewarding to go through this and, and finally launch it. And the feedback that we've received is uh, actually quite remarkable. And I can actually share a little bit more as we as we go along. Um, but I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of an introduction uh, on the research work that we've done and, and, and maybe also my background. Um, I started actually working in, well, by accident in geothermal uh, in, in a role for, for a bank. And, as part of that, we did a lot of high-level uh, research on the geothermal market, uh, trying to understand where is developing happening, where are developers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that has been very interesting to, to 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 look for this because at that time we couldn't find the data that that we needed to evaluate projects. We found a lot of technical details uh, in research papers and and the likes, but. But financial data uh, overview on, on on development, etc., was uh, was very difficult uh, to, to to get. So I started, you know, working on this research, and that's basically also the basis of some of the work done with Think Energy. And if you report on data on a daily basis uh, on project development, uh, we always update our database at the same time. And based on that, we have a wealth of information that we've collected and. Uh, and sharing uh, with charts that we publish regularly, either in form of news pieces or uh, on social media, you might have seen some of it. Uh, and increasingly, we've also done uh, bespoke client research on, on market uh, development worldwide uh, that we've sold uh, to uh, individual clients. Um, so what data are we actually collecting? And it's basically also part of, of our work and, and that finds itself in the uh, in the map that we, we published. So essentially you have these three elements. You have the plants, projects, and companies, and this has been the basis of our research. Uh, so plants, very traditional, actually, is the name of the plant, uh, the location, uh, so the region and the country, uh, the installed capacity, uh, but also the, the operating capacity. Uh, the uh, technology uh, behind the plant, so is it a binary plant, is it a flash, or single flash plant, is it a, a back pressure unit, etc. Uh, then the turbine producer, so what turbine producer sets it up, how many units are installed, uh, how many wells, the resource temperature developers, uh, the developer of the project or the plant, <coughs> and the actual operator. Uh, and actually a, a few additional more details that, that, that we collect. Uh, as much as possible, and as you you might understand, is that for for some plants we might not have all of those information, uh, but naturally the goal is to collect it, collect everything for every single plant. 
Uh, and then you have projects and actually projects can turn into plans. So there's a certain correlation in, in the data uh, we collect. Uh, so here the, uh, the stage of development actually is an interesting element that uh, is important for, uh, for, uh, for example, companies evaluating uh, market opportunities, uh, the technology, etc. The companies involved, uh, the financing naturally is an interesting element as well. Uh, and then naturally companies uh, and companies, uh, this could be uh, the developer, could be the operator, could be the service provider, the drilling company, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and actually that connects then in a, in a relational database to the plans, to the projects uh, and, and could kind of, you could look it up um, across uh, these uh, different uh, uh, database uh, points. Um, and we've, we've struggled a little bit in a sense of what to do with it, with the data, you know, and then we've looked at different business models and because naturally it takes a lot of time and effort to develop uh, those databases and to maintain them. Um, and uh, it's it's very tricky what to do with it. And, and we've seen this with other uh, service providers, uh, big uh, financial uh, websites that you might know uh, without naming them, uh, that charge uh, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars per per year for a subscription. And we've naturally looked into this in a way of could that be an option for uh, for Think Energy to make this data available. Uh, but then the challenge actually is, is that uh, these uh, companies actually provide this data for uh, for different sectors, solar, wind, biomass, hydropower, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the price is actually quite, you know, if you, for the wealth of information that you get is actually quite good. But for geothermal, actually, it's a little bit different because uh, we have a, a much smaller market uh, we have uh, fewer players uh, and also uh, fewer players that are willing to to pay, uh, let's say, a subscription fee. So we've kind of worked this uh, back and forth and, and, and in the end decided that uh, we continue to provide a, a model where we provide our news for free uh, with the support of, of the, the advertisement that we sell on the website. Uh, and at the same time kind of create some top level uh, uh, information on development on our website, uh, but but offer deep, deeper research uh, for sale, uh, either individual for desktop research uh, for clients, uh, or more general in reports that we're gonna kind of uh, sell on the website. And with that, we hope to create a model that that people understand uh, is needed for us to to fund the work that we do, um, and uh, at the same time, you know, help us kind of develop further. Uh, data because I think one of the challenges in the geothermal world is that we need more reliable data. Uh, we see this with data that's shared uh, by by different organizations um, that the data is often not quite necessarily uh, 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 correct. Uh, and and I will get to this uh, in the uh, in the course of this presentation. Um, and with that data, we're naturally uh, I mean and it, it's for anyone that is working a lot with data, it is actually really interesting what you what you can get out of the data. And 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 for example, here this is the our updated uh, power plant uh, or power uh, database of the installed capacity. Um, and uh, this is data that if you maintain a database and you constantly update it with the news that we report, you have always an up to date status of, for example, here in this case, the installed capacity. This is our infamous uh, top 10 geothermal countries uh, uh, for, for power generation uh, a list that we've shared here with the uh, top five countries being part of the one gigawatt club. Uh, and we constantly update this so we can always, at any time uh, within the year, we can give you an up-to-date figure of the current installed capacity. Um, and actually doing the, the data work behind our map, uh, you know, we collected all this data and it's, and it's an, an updated data. And this gives you a fantastic overview uh, and data to play with for different uh, presentations. And, and here in this case, it's the overview of uh, uh, the development by technology in the year. Uh, so here are the different uh, turbine technologies. 
uh, being used uh, and to see the development how this has been developed over the uh, the past few years uh, or since uh, actually the first plant in 1958 here uh, uh, built up uh, and so on and it's, and it's and it gives a very interesting picture also of certain technology trends um, and, and and I guess particularly here the the increased uh, development in binary cycle technology uh, but this is only an example of, of kind of what the data we can derive out of the the, the, the database that we've created and the data we've collected uh, here's another overview uh, similar thing same uh, based on the years but here the the capacity development by region uh, and it shows the certain peaks of developments in certain regions at certain times uh, so in north america in the 80s uh, Asia in the in the, in the 90s and um, a further development than in, in other countries for example in Africa or in, in the regions and as part of our research work we've we've shared a lot of data uh, and this is for example a, a study that we did we, we looked at kind of the the, the different development in uh, in Turkey versus Indonesia and here the the thought was is to look at kind of kind of what impact does policy have on development uh, and can we show this graphically over the years um, and based on that we also looked at the different average size of the plants etc and it gave a, a very interesting picture showing here like the relatively fast development uh, in in turkey compared to indonesia uh, here in this time period from 2006 to 2017 uh, and it kind of shows the the impact and, and and so on and it was really really interesting to share and it, and it gives decision uh, uh, or possibilities for people for, for for countries or or policymakers to decide what works or what doesn't uh, uh, but also for developers to see here that actually smaller scale development maybe helps to develop faster uh, and so, things like that we can derive out of out of data and that it shows how important data is a foreign industry to both promote what it can offer but at the same time uh, make decisions on policy for example or technology um, but now stepping into the into our map and, and you will find naturally the map on our website uh, thinkgenergy.com slash map uh, but also if you click on the power power plant map uh, uh, link on the menu of thinkgenergy.com um, and I wanted to give you an overview of what we are showing on the map uh, and, and, and what is kind of like deeper behind in the database um, that we have. So here the example, uh, this is uh, the Ulubelo uh, uh, unit one and two uh, plant and what we, what we show on the, on the map when you click on one of the, the plant locations, uh, you see the plant or the plant group. Uh, and what we did actually, we, we grouped plants that are or units that are on the same site. Uh, and that's why here in this case you have unit one and two uh, as one plant group so to speak uh, we share the country and the installed capacity and the uh, technology of the turbines but naturally the database has a lot of more details behind it uh, such as the uh, the region the operator the developer the operating capacity the, the uh, technology the turbine the number of units um, the start of commercial operations, uh, the suppliers, uh, the number of wells, the resource temperature, etc. And again, the challenge is like how much of that data you make available. And um, like I said, we've been struggling uh, a little bit on that and we've constantly received requests for sharing that data uh, publicly uh, in, the, in the notion of, of open source and all these things. And, but it's but it's tricky for us because uh, naturally this takes a lot of effort and investment from our, our ourselves and uh, the difficulty is like we we are we are not on a payroll with regards to think Genergy for someone paying us to do that kind of work and and with that it's very difficult to make this uh, completely freely available so we're trying to share as much as we can but at the same time maintain a business model that helps us fund uh, the work that we do. Uh, and here uh, going into a bit more depth um, so this is then actually if you click on the satellite view on, on the map uh, and then go further down you can scroll down all the way down to the cooling towers of the plant 
Uh, and in this case, it's probably a good example here, Ulubelo. It shows you the location of the unit one and two of the plant, uh, and at the same time showing the, the closeness of uh, unit three and four, which you find with the uh, purple roofs here uh, on, the, on the right. Uh, and we could have, uh, for example, simply easily created uh, one plant group for all the four units, but given that they're separated uh, like this uh, location-wise, we decided to split this, but, a, but as I said, in the groups unit one and two together and unit three and four together in this case. And this is the way we've done this with uh, the website. And the kind of to kind of go a little bit more into the depth of what we have then in our database here and just to show you. So for example, here, Ulubelo units one to four, um, the location actually in South Sumatra in Indonesia, um, the operator of the plants here, in this case, it's Pertamina Geothermal Energy. Uh, the difference of unit two, one and two, they both started operations in 2012 uh, and have two 55 megawatt single flash units uh, installed by Fuji Electric. Uh, and then, and actually, this is something that we're, we're, what we're working on. We have for a large number of plants, we have we have that information for others, we're working on it, uh, and it's actually uh, nailing down kind of how many production wells, re-injection wells, and maybe what wells have been drilled but are not uh, in use today. Um, and here, in this case, unit one and two, there's are 13 production wells, six re-injection wells, uh, and these are all set up in five well uh, groups or clusters. Uh, unit three and four here, then different 12 production wells and five reinjection wells uh, uh, structured over six uh, well clusters and the production zone temperature of around 275 degree naturally depending a little bit on the on the well. And then we, we, we maintain additional information, for example, here in this case, the EPC contractor for the plant. I guess we mentioned the, the turbine producer, Fuji Electric, but also where the financing uh, of the plants comes from. Uh, and with that, basically, we create. We want to try to create a database that keeps a good update over uh, overview over those plants. And again, uh, um, some of this data we will make available in, in short country overviews. Uh, but uh, then we will provide more concrete uh, country uh, reports that go into depth and also share uh, details about projects and, and development. Uh, legislative elements, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, and these are then reports we're going to, to make available on our website uh, for purchase. Um, and as I said, it is extremely uh, nice to actually have a database that you can play with, with, with data to create all kinds of overviews and, and, and details. And, and this is uh, something that is we briefly kind of derived out of our database today. It's like just looking at the share of technology by, by, by country. And here we just took the three countries of the US, Indonesia, and uh, Turkey. And it shows the difference in the, in the technology <clears throat> being utilized to generate uh, power from geothermal. <clears throat> um, so, so here you see that uh, in the US, uh, dry steam is, 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 is a big share uh, in the overall uh, generation. Uh, uh, the flash units here, single, double, and triple flash together, um, and, uh, and, and the increasing share of binary cycle technology in the US. Now in Indonesia, the other way around, you have uh, very little binary technology. And I think just in, in, recent, in recent years, uh, they were added uh, through the plants at Sarula, and a small scale uh, plant in Landong. Uh, but otherwise, these are single flash uh, plants, uh, mostly, or single double flash plants. Uh, in Turkey, a uh, complete different picture here, uh, a low temperature uh, a country or low enthalpy a country. Uh, so 84% of all the capacity installed today is actually uh, produced by binary cycle technology. Uh, and I think that's also an interesting uh, example. And actually with the database, you can then also go in due detail of in what country, what turbine producer uh, is leading with regards to the installed capacity, et cetera. Uh, and you can provide some some really interesting uh, data points. <clears throat> uh, and then you can look at the different operator. Uh, and naturally, a lot of the operators have 
set up different uh, uh, subsidiaries or, or, or companies that operate certain uh, certain plans in certain countries or in certain uh, regions or on on site. Um, so we 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 have them individually as the developers or the operator, but we also have them set up as the uh, as the groups based on the uh, ownership. Uh, and this is an overview as of the database today. So we have EDC as the largest operator, uh, followed by uh, uh, CFE in Mexico and then Orma Technologies. And uh, I have to state here that. Uh, this is the operating capacity, not the installed capacity. The picture would be looking a little bit different if we would only look at the installed capacity. <clears throat> and this gives a good good overview. And uh, at this point, I didn't want to share uh, further details on the other uh, top operators, uh, but we might do so in the in the coming weeks. Um, with regards to the uh, uh, the data that we have uh, today on the on in our database to give you an idea. So of these 15,500 megawatts installed capacity today, um, we have uh, the locations for around 15,000 for about 350 megawatts. Um, and we're missing still 150 megawatts in locations. And these are predominantly small scale uh, plants, for example, in Japan that are so small that you actually, they don't really have a cooling tower for, for you to find. Um, so we've been struggling uh, to find those uh, locations, uh, but we're working on that and we will keep the, uh, the map and the database updated. So what is next uh, in what we do with uh, Think Geology and our research? And, and that's naturally a, a big question, but uh, what, what we've been working on uh, naturally with, uh, depending on the, the, um, the resources available to us, uh, we're, we're working on establishing uh, an international research team uh, with uh, people in different regions that help us uh, maintain and update our, our databases and create uh, research uh, for, for for us, for for industry and for clients. Um, and we are in the process of setting up a, a dedicated research site, uh, which will be launched uh, on our website in January. Uh, so in the upcoming January, and that will include, uh, you know, step-by-step -step country overviews and regional overviews, but also some more, let's say, uh, technical overviews, uh, hopefully then uh, and on an ongoing basis. And at the same time, we've been working for, for quite some time on larger scale research reports uh, for clients, uh, for example, on global overviews on, on development um, and, uh, um, and that is also ongoing uh, research that we do. Um, and what is important to state, I think, is, is the notion is that the, the interest uh, in the growing interest in geothermal uh, is something positive, but it also highlights the need for data. So a lot of actually players contact us to understand, okay, where, where are growth markets? Uh, where are markets to sell specific products? Uh, and, and based on that, for example, on projects, uh, you figure out where, um, where where projects are in the development cycle, uh, what products they need at certain stages, uh, what funding is in place. And in that sense, essentially uh, providing countries an opportunity to invest in, let's say, in market development efforts in certain regions, be it in, in Africa or in, 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 in Southeast Asia or elsewhere. Uh, and I think that's pretty much uh, it from my side on the map. And I assume that you would have uh, a few questions and I would be more than willing to, uh, to answer additional questions that you might, uh, you might have. Uh, and otherwise you can always contact us uh, individually here or with the emails provided. Uh, and like I said, we, we will be working on sharing additional information naturally as the ongoing reporting on Think Geology with news. And in that context also, if you're, if you're missing news, I mean, make sure to, to send, send us an email, uh, share the news, um, and we're trying to post it as, as frequent as we, as we can. And with that, over to Jochen, maybe to, to steer the, the questions. 
Thank you very much, Alexander, for this very interesting presentation. Um, there are already some questions. Just want to jump in, uh, as probably there will be uh, many of them. Um, the first question is, is, is just a bit of, of a kind of comprehensive. Probably not all are familiar with, with the terms you used. Uh, could you just quickly explain binary, flash and dry steam? Yes, uh, so so in essence, very briefly, so essentially, uh, you know, the, you generate power by turning a turbine uh, and the turbine in, in, in all cases in geothermal are driven by steam. Uh, and if you have uh, hot enough uh, resources, you can utilize the steam directly. Uh, and in the case of dry steam, I think the, the name is uh, self-explanatory. You have dry steam and you can utilize that dry steam relatively directly to in with piping into a turbine and then basically the turbine is, is turned. Um, the flash condensing uh, uh, systems, um, they are, uh, they are uh, often wet steam and you have to take out the, the, the water out of the steam so that then dry steam can be used to turn the turbine. Uh, this is very simplified. Uh, I mean, like I said, we were gonna, we're working on additional content on the website that will explain those elements as well. Uh, but essentially you utilizing the, the steam or wet steam uh, from a resource, uh, take the water out of the steam and the steam then turns a turbine. Um, and binary cycle uh, technology uh, is uh, then uh, a different element. So here basically you have uh, uh, a technology that utilizes a secondary fluid uh, that boils at lower temperatures uh, and you utilize that steam from that uh, fluid to turn a turbine. Uh, and the binary cycle technologies are uh, more complex, um, but uh, are providing an opportunity for a complete closed uh, system. Uh, so the resource that you tap into allow uh, the utilization of geothermal resources, uh, I think starting at, at 70 degrees Celsius. Um, and they can be used uh, even for higher temperatures uh, up to 180. Uh, or likely even more, but I think turbine co companies will have to answer that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so binary technology basically allows the utilization of geothermal for power generation uh, at regions uh, beyond the, the high temperature re regions uh, or volcanic regions of this world. And that maybe also explains why Turkey or countries like, like Germany actually can utilize geothermal by utilizing these binary cycle technology. Okay, thanks uh, for this quick explanation. Then we step into the map. Uh, what is the scope of the map? It looks like power plants uh, are here presented, not heat plants. Are there any plans to expand it also in the heat direction? <laughs> this is a very, very good <laughs> question. And then, uh, uh, I mean, and, and, and what to say? Yeah, I mean, I absolutely would love uh, to, to also uh, cover ge uh, geothermal from a, for a heating perspective. And, uh, and I think we do this in the reporting of Think Energy uh, more and more with covering heat, uh, definitely more so than we did 10 years ago. Uh, so, yeah, so I mean, and the interest naturally for heating has grown. So, uh, I see ourselves, I think, over over long to, to also work on heating. Uh, but then again, what, what you then face as a problem, just as a practical uh, challenge, is uh, what defines then a geothermal heating system? Is it a shallow geothermal heat pump uh, or is exactly, it a yeah. large scale, uh, you know, fluid based uh, heat recovery utilized for heating or cooling? Uh, and, and that is extremely difficult. And I think a lot of us in the industry struggle on how to, how to figure out how we can map or, 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 or collect that data. And it's very, it's very challenging, uh, but something that I think we need to do. And I think, you know, I can say that, for example, the European Geothermal Energy Council in Brussels is doing a good work on, on mapping and, and maintaining a database on, on heating projects. But yeah, I see, I see us, you know, if we can secure some funding and, 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 and support uh, to go into that as well, and then hopefully map heating projects as well, and then define exactly what, what heating projects we're talking about. Uh, but naturally heat pumps, naturally you have a different individual homes with heat pumps. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, impossible to do. Um, and the other challenge is the availability of data. It's just extremely difficult 
to get sufficient uh, and reliable data for heating use. Uh, okay, thanks, probably Alex, a big challenge. Alex, Alex. Perhaps we keep your answers a bit shorter, uh, as there course, are many yes. questions. Um, how do you get all the information uh, and the data data that you mentioned just? just a few seconds ago, which some of them are confidential data. Um, so uh, to make it very clear, uh, all the data that we are collecting uh, or at least publishing uh, is data that is publicly available. Uh, and publicly available is through research documents, through presentations at conferences, etc., etc. Uh, we are not publishing uh, uh, confidential information that uh, we have through client work. Uh, we don't do that, so we really differentiate. Okay, uh, the next question goes in a similar direction. Do you get the data on the power plant from the developers or from the utilities? Do you also keep track of decommissioned power plants? So yes, so naturally we, we keep track on all the projects that are in development. So for example, we have a database uh, with around 1200 uh, geothermal power projects or prospects that we maintain and if projects progress they move them into and then they start operation we move them into the plant map um, and data we derive from uh, both developers and operators uh, but also from uh, national databases like for example power regulators uh, etc and uh, and i can say it's, it's not always easy because for example for for different uh, plants you have different names, like some plans have different names in, in the country and internationally. Uh, and you also have uh, sometimes, for example, in Kenya and elsewhere, you have uh, sometimes five different capacity numbers uh, stated for for turbines or plants. And naturally, that's also a challenge with operating and uh, installed nameplate capacity, but also operating capacity, etc. And I think that's also a point I want to make uh, with regards to the capacity is that we're facing, for example, as a geothermal industry, the challenge is that uh, you have uh, people outside of the industry collecting data uh, on geothermal for international organizations such as IRENA uh, and RAIN21. And they're applying uh, a methodology to collecting the data that is very strict on certain countries because of the availability of data, but not so for other countries, providing not necessarily the correct uh, view or the current status of development. So that's something that we've been targeting together with our colleagues at IGA. Um, and we're very disappointed that uh, particularly, you know, um, our, our friends, uh, you know, um, have been using data that is not necessarily giving the equal same picture for different countries and thereby distorting the data that is presented. I think this is where we as an industry also need to become stronger. Uh, and, and I naturally, through Think Genity, try to give that a more concrete voice and, and data overview. Thanks, Alex. The next question is, hi, thanks for the info. Would the projects uh, loaded on the interactive map? I think he wants to ask if, if you also will mention projects here. Um, I point again to my, my statements I made earlier with regards to kind of what, how much can we share publicly and, uh, and, uh, and make it available for free based on the work that we've invested in it and the value provided by that data. Um, so in short, the answer is no, we won't share this data publicly, uh, but we, we have a map uh, that shows projects uh, worldwide and we're working on that uh, internally. Uh, how we make this available, um, we will have to see. Thanks. The next question is from an earlier participant, an earlier asking participant, and he's asking, and at what point in the life cycle do you show a plant in the free map? Uh, so as soon as the plant uh, has started commercial operation. Okay, then there is another question. Why don't you put each unit independently? Independently, I think this is just referred to this picture. Yeah, we've we've been struggling to make the the, the data usable in a sense of 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 uh, you know making it usable and and user more user friendly. The challenge is if you have for every single unit. Um, and we even kind of 
we even were challenged by how to record this in our database. Do we have for every plant, every single unit, uh, and then collecting the data? Um, and we've been struggling how to do this, and I don't really have an answer what's the best way to do it. But we decided for practicality reasons to create so-called plant groups, like I explained earlier, uh, in particular where these different units are on one side and you, and you cannot really differentiate between the different, different units. Uh, for example, here unit one and two that are in the same uh, turbine house um, and same for the unit three and four here. Thanks. The next question is, how do you follow updates from every location? Do you wait until came to public through publication or have you uh, own means to track updates? I guess in the in the dream scenario, we would basically have a live stream to the operators. Uh, and as soon as there's a change there, that, that will be live feeded into, into our map and our database. Uh, that is clearly something that we thought about and I think would be brilliant for the geothermal industry to have. Uh, but at the moment, it's basically it's a press release, and then maybe us following uh, um, back up with the with the with the developer, um, and uh, to to see and the, or the operator what the status is. So, for example, if there's a decrease in capacity or an increase through an expansion, etc. Um, but maybe in that context, I also want to uh, maybe address a point that I wanted to make as well. Um, and I guess also here in in this case, uh, particular given that on this card here on the left, you see two plants in Australia, and you might actually ask yourself, well, isn't there just one or is there none? Um, we've actually kept uh, a number of smaller plants uh, online, despite a very uh, an unclear situation if they're still operating or not, uh, just for historic reasons um, and uh, the possibility of them being being re reinstated. So here, for example, in Australia, the, the, very, the two very small plants of uh, Birdsville um, and uh, the new one in in Winton in Queensland and uh, yeah in in uh, in Australia. Thanks. The next question is: Do you track changes to plants and wells over time as they might change? We sure we sure try to do to follow as quickly as we can uh, through our news reporting. Uh, so, for example, if if we understand that there's a there's a Let's take an example at Alkaya. If, if 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 one of the plants now there will be a turbine overhaul uh, and a new turbine, and the new turbine has a has a higher capacity, uh, we will naturally reflect that in the system. The next question is in general: What is the percent difference between installed capacity and operating capacity? It is dependent more on the technique used or other factors. So yeah, so what what we've been trying to do uh, in our database is that that we that we differentiate between the installed capacity and the operating capacity, uh, and we and, and we also trying to only report on uh, the uh, installed capacity or the installed turbine that is still operating, even though it might not operate at full capacity. So if you have a 100 megawatt plant and it's like it is it has an installed uh, 250 megawatt turbines, uh, but we understand that only one of the turbines would operate, uh, so the the operating would be 50 megawatt. We would only report the 50 megawatt, but we would maintain uh, the 100 megawatt as installed. But if a plant is 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 installed capacity but is not operating at all, we would not uh, show this in our database. And I can give you. Uh, an example in the United States, for example, um, and that's also the what I refer to with regards to the difference in reporting on the capacity, um, is that the installed capacity in the U.S. is about 3,700 megawatts, uh, but the 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 average capacity operating in the summer and winter times uh, is given by uh, the the this the EIA in the in the U.S. at 2,700 megawatts. And there are conflicting opinions on how to report this. Uh, and our 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 stake has been is that given that other countries don't differentiate like that, uh, we should actually report the full capacity for the U.S. Uh, and like I said, what we though do, we just take out the capacity that is not operating or has not operated at one point in time of that year. Um, and the difference, I guess, for our power plant map, uh, I just looked it up today. We had 5,500 megawatts. 
installed capacity and we had around 14,050, I think, operating. I think this was the, the number that I, that I currently have in the, in the database. But again, Thanks. a lot of countries actually don't differentiate it as such. Thanks. The next question is there a need for volunteer participants in augmenting the database? Uh, always. So we always uh, encourage people to to be in touch with us, and and, and if they if they see a you know a possibility for them to help us, and uh, and we've actually engaged with quite a few uh, number of individuals and companies to provide us that data. I mean, the turbine producers have been quite helpful over the years, and uh, and, and certain individuals uh, that I'm that we're very grateful for. And I think just publishing the data. Uh, has been also very interesting because people said, like, oh, we're missing these plants. And it's like, yeah, can you please provide us the, the, the data? And for example, with that, we, we quickly then uh, got the locations for the Los Homeros plants uh, in Mexico. So yeah, so if you, if, you, if you feel a plant is missing or you want to update or you want to help us, please reach out to me and we'll, we'll gladly figure something out. And here another question. Do you consider start collecting data of not only operating plans but also future projects in or in build ones. Yeah. So, so uh, like I said, you we, answered already. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the challenge, the challenge actually is, is like how do you how do you maintain track uh, or, or keep track of, of of project development? And we have a project database, uh, and we can then easily flip a project that is that starts operation. We can flip this into an operating plant, and thereby that becomes part of the uh, of of the map, but at the same time, um, you know, and then that's also the difficulty, like with regards to uh, showing you the development worldwide. Um, if you maintain only a database of of plants that are operating, the challenge is you're missing some of the capacity that has been installed over the years because you want to provide that picture as well, and it's it's not always quite easy how to do it. But we're trying to maintain the database also with with plants that are not operational anymore. And I think the a good example would be the Copa Ua plant in Argentina, uh, which I think we still have in our map simply for a historic reason, but this hasn't operated in, in, a, in, a, in a very long time. Okay, thank you. There is another comment, fabulous presentation and Q&A session. Thank you. I think there might be value in incorporating plant developments. Um, I also want to mention, uh, the question is, when do you start to integrate a plant? At, at which stage is the question? And um, I think that the project should should have at minimum, for example, for Germany, a 3D seismic survey. However, in, in other countries, there is no 3D seismic survey. So if, if anyone is thinking of a project, um, I think this is not worthy mentioning it in a database. What do you think? Well, I would I would disagree, and then the reason is is simple, simple that is that you know I think it, if it, if a plant is operating, it's very clear uh, to be in the database. Yes. But but uh, what uh, but the project list that I mentioned, the database that we have there, we call it project list. Uh, you could call it projects and prospects, um, but we also maintain, like I said, as part of the project database, we also maintain projects that we that we label as, as prospects. Uh, and prospects would be, for example, if there's a permit in place or a lease, um, but no further uh, information. Uh, so for example, let's take uh, some of the areas in Uganda uh, where there's concrete data available of, of, of early geochemistry studies, and it's defined as a prospect area. Uh, then, we may, then we put this into our database, but label it as a prospect. Uh, without any concrete development activities yet. So no seismicity, no geochemistry or any exploration act activity. Uh, and then with that, actually, you create, uh, you know, a database that provides, you know, different categories of projects. So prospects, projects that have actually started exploration work, projects that have started, uh, you know, production drilling and those that are in construction. Uh, and with that, actually, you get a good overview. And, and I think I can roughly state that probably of the of the projects that we have in our database, it, I pro probably would say that probably 60% of them are prospects. Uh, so very early stage projects per se, so not projects yet. 
uh, so maybe that kind of explains it a little bit the way we differentiate so so yeah so even we call the project list is this maintains uh, projects at all kinds of stages of development from the very early prospecting uh, uh, stage to the construction and actually when they start operating as a, as a power plant they move then over into the power plant map okay Alexander thank you very much You're welcome. so we move on uh, with the announcement of the next webinar. We will keep it in English for the next time. And the reason is uh, actual uh, case here happened. Uh, we had recently these earthquakes in north of Strasbourg and uh, we invited Jean Schmidtbuhl, he is the head uh, of the EOST at the University of Strasbourg and he will give a presentation about the recent earthquake in Strasbourg, first lessons learned from seismic observations. So this will be the last webinar for this year, uh, next week at December 18 and then we will start again in January. So thank you very much to everyone for listening. Thank you very much to Alexander for giving this very interesting presentation and looking forward to see you next week. Otherwise, have a nice end of the year and hopefully a nice Christmas time. Bye-bye.